Welcome. Uh, my name is Kelly Pike. I am the interim director of the Global Labor Research Center. And on behalf of the, the GLRC here at York, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second John Elling Annual Lecture in Global Labor. We're very excited this evening to welcome Kike Roach, who will be introduced more formally in just a few minutes by a member of our organizing committee. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by um, with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous, indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peace, peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So just a little bit about the GLRC. The GLRC engages in the study of work, employment, and labor in the context of a changing global economy. We host research projects and visiting researchers, organize a regular speaker series, and an annual graduate student conference taking place today and tomorrow. We also work with unions and workers' organizations to both better understand the changing world of work and support interventions designed to prompt, prompt progressive social change. The John Elian Annual Lecture in Global Labor is an initiative of the GLRC. John Elin was the research director of the Ontario Federation of Labor for over 20 years. With the support of his wife, Ann Thompson, who is in attendance with us tonight, we have established this annual lecture in his name, which will explore pressing social and economic problems of our times. As you can no doubt gather from the title of tonight's event, which is Reclamation, Feminism, Labor, and the Unlearning of Radical History, the lecture we will hear this evening certainly fits that description. Uh, before we begin the lecture, I would like to acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors of this event. So we have the Ontario Federation of Labour, Unifor, Layuna Ontario Provincial District Council, Cavaluzzo LLP, and Goldblatt Partners LLP. As I mentioned, this lecture is part of the GLRC's annual graduate symposium, which is supported by many bodies at York University, and I'm going to take this opportunity to acknowledge those, those uh, faculties and departments. We have the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, the Faculty of Graduate Studies, Vice President of Research and Innovation, Vice President Academic and Provost, Canada Research Chair in the Political Economy of Gender and Work, Canada Research Chair in Migration, Policy, Impact, and Activism, Institute for Feminist Legal Studies, Faculty of Environmental Studies, School of Gender, Sexual, and Women's Studies, Center for Feminist Research, York Center for Asian Research, School of Human Resource Management, School of Public Policy and Administration, Department of Politics, Department of History, Department of Anthropology, Department of Sociology, the Spaces of Labor in Moments of Urban Populism Project, the Canadian Association for Work and Labor Studies, Layuna Enrico Henry Mancinelli Professor in Global Labor Issues at McMaster University, finally the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Your broad base of support for, for tonight's lecture and for the symposium. I am now going to turn to a member of our, our organizing committee. Um, I'm actually just going to do that in, in one second. I first want to just take a moment to also acknowledge Eva Spolkin. She's the coordinator of the GLRC and has done a lot of work for the symposium and, and bringing this lecture together. No doubt you've been in touch with her sometime over the past months. And also our organizing committee, which is made up entirely of graduate students. So we have at the door Lacey, we have Rowan at the front, Aliyah, Rahina, and Caitlin. So they've put a very wonderful program together. I'd like to thank them for, for all their hard work. Now I'm gonna call on okay. Now I'm gonna call on one of those uh, members of the organizing committee to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. I'm calling on Aliyah Karim. Thank you. 
happy to introduce Kike. Kike Roach is the Unicorn National Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson, the first union endowed chair at a Canadian university. She's cross appointed to the Department of Politics and the School of Social Work, where she teaches courses on human rights and social movements. She is a principal organizer of Social Justice Week and other multi-disciplinary events as part of her mandate to create a hub of interaction between social justice activists and academics. Kike earned a degree in philosophy at McGill University before studying law in France at Université Jean Moulin in Lyon and in Kingston at Queen's University. As a lawyer, she has fought against police brutality and the abuse of power for many years representing organizations like the Black Action Defense Committee and the Community Alliance for Social Justice. She was counsel for individuals in civil lawsuits against the state for assault, malicious prosecution, wrongful detention, negligence, and breach of charter rights. She has represented clients at all levels of court, including as assistant counsel and electoral law case for the Communist Party before the Supreme Court of Canada. Kike is co-author of the book, Politically Speaking, with Judy Rebick, a series of lively conversations on feminism and Canadian politics. She has served as an executive member of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the Women's Coalition for Employment Equity and Women Tendency, uh, Black Women's in, uh, International Film and Video Festival, and has been an active member of other community groups. For 10 years with the Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration Committee, she organized Martin's Day, an annual day-long festival of arts and discussion celebrating the theory and practice of nonviolence. Kike was also a coordinator of the Freedom Ride Project, which organized busloads of activists to protest uh, apartheid and systemat systemic racism in Canada. She has appeared frequently in the media and was a regular commentator on current and legal affairs on CTV News and CBC News World, among others. Kike has designed and led workshops on anti-racism, feminism, and leadership for EPFO, FW, USW, and CAW, that's now Unicorn, amongst others. She has addressed a variety of audiences across Canada and in the United States on issues of social justice, history, race, gender, and progressive change. So please join me in welcoming Kike. Thank you very much. I feel very honored to be here. Thank you for welcoming this recovering lawyer. Um, I want to start off by uh, saying thank you uh, to all of the people that put this together. Um, the Global Learning Research Center, Kelly, Ives, the Planning Committee, and all of the sponsors. Um, and I, of course, also want to thank uh, all of the people who have taken care uh, and who have uh, continued to take care of these lands that we work and live on. So my respect and uh, appreciation to all the various different uh, indigenous nations of Tecronto, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, um, and uh, to those who have passed, to those who continue to struggle and thrive here. So we, we heard that this is the dish with one spoon um, covenant uh, territory. And um, parts of that covenant speak to our duties to share and to keep the peace. And to me, that causes me to reflect um, on my own actions and consider what ways I can work for a world where um, power and resources are shared um, justly and where people can grow and live in peace um, together. And it causes me also to reflect on the ways in which my ancestors did that work. And so here we are in February, and you know, they, they gave us the coldest, shortest month to tell our story, but March is Women's History Month, so I'm taking an intersectional approach and I'm gonna keep talking about <laughs> an additional month. Um, 
And as I was beginning to, to think about what I wanted to share with you tonight, I was struck by this whole concept of time, actually, the notion of progress. And um, recently, you know, at the Women's March, we saw that there were many people who had signs that said, we won't go back. And we've heard people decrying um, the Ford government's turning the clock back on sex education. And of course, there's that ugly red hat that talks about returning to a time when supposedly things were great. Um, so of course, I understand when people say, um, we won't go back. But, but, while others want to take us back historically, um, we shouldn't be afraid to at least look back and reflect on our history, because um, amnesia is a friend to systems that are built on gross exploitation and genocide and, and broken treaties and failure to deliver reparations. So today, I want to build my talk around um, what we might recall and what we might reclaim. This image is the uh, Dinkra symbol of the Akan people of uh, West Africa, and it's known as the Sankofa. And um, the Sankofa expresses the idea that we have to go back and reclaim our past so that we can move forward and understand why and how we came to be who we are today. So it's a, based on a mythical bird, but she's only looking back. Her body is firmly faced forward um, with the egg symbolizing the future in her mouth. And this is the Akan people's expression of believing that the past can serve to help us plan for the future. So the, the central point that I want to make in this talk is that we have to stop letting others distort our history, co-opt our language, define our agenda, and divert our path to creating a better world. We want to draw strength from our history. But for that, we need to see it accurately and reclaim what's been hidden from us. So I'm going to tell a few stories tonight about gender, about race, about struggles for decent work and better lives. And, um, and think about some of the people who made this world a better place. All too often when history is told, black women and working class people are pushed from the center stage or their narratives are distorted, their actions hollowed out. Take uh, Rosa Parks, for example. In so many accounts, she's stripped of her lifelong history of activism and she's recast as a quiet, humble woman who was uh, not angry, who never raised her voice. The media even described her as an accidental matriarch of the civil rights movement. This is an official poster, The Power of One. As it goes, she's this solo figure who just sat on a bus one day and uh, not giving up her seat to a white man when ordered to do so, supposedly because she was tired and wanted to rest her feet. But uh, she said, I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free so other people could be free. She said, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. And Rosa Parks had been kicked off the bus actually many times before she was arrested in um, December of 55. This woman was an experienced organizer, a secretary of the Montgomery and National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And in that capacity, um, one of her main jobs was to actually document cases of violence or discrimination against black people in the hopes of possibly obtaining redress. A number of black women at the time had been raped by white men who were police officers and residents, um, in one case a store owner. And this led to Rosa Parks becoming an experienced anti-rape activist. Um, the NAACP used to send her to investigate these cases, and she gathered testimony and informed other activists, and they demanded criminal prosecutions. And when the police and the law failed, they launched a number of campaigns um, for justice on behalf of these women. In one case, the activists um, who were working on voter registration actually pulled together with her at the Women's Political Council and joined 
to organize a boycott of a white grocery, of that white grocery store owner who had raped a young black girl who was babysitting for his family at the time. So the black community boycotted his store and delivered their own guilty verdict, um, driving him out of business. And as Danielle McGuire writes, it was a history of sexual assaults on black women and of the use of the boycott as a powerful weapon for justice that laid the groundwork for what was to come. So in fact, the Montgomery bus boycott was a protest against racial and sexual violence. City buses were a, a fitting target for mass protest because the working class black women, many of them who were domestic workers, you see them walking, they walked for 381 days before um, they won. Uh, it was working class black women who were mainly domestic workers who were almost 70% of the bus ridership. And they were sick of the racist bullying and sexual harassment of the bus drivers. And that they were subjected to this on a daily basis. And they complained. They said that they, uh, nasty um, things were, statements were hurled at them, sexualized insults, um, bus drivers touching them inappropriately. And uh, they were physically abused by some. And about a year before Parks was arrested, the Women's Political Council threatened a boycott of Montgomery city buses when city officials um, failed to address the problems. And it was these African-American women who walked for hundreds of miles to protest their humiliation and reclaim their bodies. These women were the chief strategists and negotiators of the boycott, and they designed the elaborate alternative carpool system, raised the money for the movement. They filled the majority of those uh, sometimes nightly mass meetings where they testified publicly about physical and sexual abuse on the buses. And this was the boycott that made Martin Luther King Jr. famous and was the spark for a period of almost 15 years of a really intense movement for freedom. And McGuire reminds us that Rosa Parks and the women who started the bus boycott fought for more than a seat on the bus. They were demanding the right to move through the world without being molested. They were fighting against police brutality and racial and sexual violence, and they were insisting on the ownership and control of their bodies. And so, lest we not forget in the Canadian context, Though um, Viola Desmond now braces our Canadian $10 bill, few Canadians know of her history of, of Viola De Desmond, let alone the long history of slavery and racial segregation in this country. Almost 10 years before Rosa Parks, um, fit her famous arrest, Viola Desmond was arrested and she was violently removed from the Roseland Theater in New Glasgow in Nova Scotia, where she had <coughs> dared to sit in the whites only section. And although she had requested a 40 cent seat on the main floor of the theater, she was sold a 30 cent balcony seat. Um, and the ticket taker told her, I'm sorry, I'm not permitted to sell downstairs tickets to you people. Um, at her trial, she testified, I offered to pay the difference in the price between the tickets, but they wouldn't accept it. And she was just immediately convicted of defrauding the government of uh, a one cent theater tax. And she was given no opportunity to tell the court about the real issues underlying those charges. Professor Backhouse writes that in the best tradition of Canadian racelessness, the prosecution witnesses never explained that Viola Desmond had been denied the more expensive downstairs ticket because of her race. No one admitted that the theater patrons were assigned uh, seats on the basis of race. And on the face of it, the proceedings appeared to be simply a prosecution for failure to pay a provincial tax. In fact, if Viola Desmond had not taken any further action on this matter, the surviving trial records right, would not have left any clue of the real significance of her case. And it was also women like Carrie Best um, who tried to uh, sue the Roseland Theater before 
um, Viola Desmond's actions. And women like Perlene Oliver, um, who founded and led the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples. And of course, the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, right, who, who were forced to uh, organize and unionize on their own because they were excluded from the white unions. Um, those are the people that would break the back of segregationist laws and practices in Canada. So I think when we think about these stories, it's more than just factual omissions and or, or historical distortions. I think what this does, the erasure of these histories of struggle against sexual and racial violence um, obscures the power and the agency that women and black people really have. Uh, recasting us as docile, as demure, and really just masking how social change actually happens, how it, social change is really made, perpetuating a myth that we live in a just society. But the, the Sankofa tells us that whatever we have lost, we have forgotten, um, or we've been stripped of, it can be reclaimed, it can be revived and preserved and perpetuated. So I actually want to take a moment to thank and congratulate the students and the faculty here at York University um, for the new uh, Canadian Black Studies certificate that was launched uh, just this year. Um, I hope that other institutions will also follow your lead because it's time to that we write people of African descent back into histories and back into our curriculum. So congratulations on, on York and everybody who made that happen. Yeah, that deserves a clap. I mean, it's long. Um, So I grew up in an activist family. My mom was a peace activist and my father was a, a civil rights lawyer. And I remember going to a lot of demonstrations um, as a little kid. And uh, when the government was trying to deport Jamaican mothers, um, we marched and we chanted, good enough to work, good enough to stay. And these were um, Jamaican women who were uh, domestic workers. And I knew that the government had let them into the country, but now didn't want them anymore. And I remembered that my father was representing them in court at that time. Um, but I didn't understand, what was it about them being black and mothers that was the problem? Um, Caribbean women had been coming to Canada for uh, a long time from under the uh, West Indian domestic uh, scheme, and since the 50s, really. And to qualify for entry, the women had to be between the ages of 18 and 35, single, widowed, or divorced, and, quote, without minor children, or the encumbrance of a common law relationship, or the issue thereof, meaning the children, right? Um, so under the West Indian domestic scheme, they were granted landed immigrant status, but the Canadian government um, reserved the right to deport them if they were deemed unsuitable for work, and that meant if they got pregnant, for example, while in Canada. But black women had aspirations beyond domestic work. They upgraded their skills at night school, and they got other jobs with better conditions and, and terminated those domestic contracts. And the Canadian government responded by bringing in new restrictions on the terms and conditions uh, for Canadian residents. And the changes were designed to just keep women in those domestic jobs. They wanted these women to be domestic workers and nothing else. And it reminded me of this slide that uh, this advertisement, um, this is an advertisement from an old Toronto publication. It was called York back then in 1806, an advertisement for Peggy, a black woman and her son where in the body of the advertisement, it says, they are each one of them servants for life. And that's what these Jamaican domestic workers were supposed to be, servants for life. Elizabeth uh, Lodge, Carmen Hyde, 
Eliza Cox, Elaine Perch, Rubina White, Gloria Lawrence, Lola Anderson. These were some the names of the, some of the women who became known as the, the under the Save the Seven campaign. They were among the thousands of Jamaican women who were coming to Canada to work as domestics right through to the 1970s. And they were ordered deported, these um, women, from Canada for failing to disclose their status as mothers of minor children that they had left behind in Jamaica. The Canadian immigration officials knew that the women um, had been instructed not to recognize their children who were not traveling with them to Canada, but they just, they just chose to ignore that because they wanted to fill those jobs and they wanted to meet the demand for domestic labor. So the women were told to basically erase the fact that they were mothers on their applications and, and then that was used by the government to want to, who wanted to erase them from the landscape, from the Canadian landscape. Elaine Pert said, we were brought here to clean rich folks' homes, and now we're not cleaning rich folks' homes, so now you want to get rid of us, now you want to throw us out. And that was typical of uh, the experience of felt by these women. They, the government wanted the women's labor, but not really the black bodies that that labor was packaged. So challenging the, the deportation orders was just a matter of survival for them. Um, the prospects of work back home were just abysmal. Uh, the International Monetary Fund had just forced the Jamaican government to implement structural adjustment programs, laying off civil servants, um, reducing public services, opening up the country to um, uh, the country's markets to uh, cheap foreign goods. And women in the formal sector faced an unemployment rate of almost 39%, twice that of the men. So in fighting for justice, the do domestic workers got support from groups like Intercede, the International Coalition to End Domestic Exploitation, and, and other groups. And uh, many immigrant women from all over the world were now making their home in Toronto, and they were organizing. Through the late 60s and 70s, immigration was on the rise. The impact of revolutionary movements that were dotting the globe could be felt. Um, the women's movement was commanding attention. And indigenous, black, Southeast Asian, and South Asian groups were in the midst of their own politicization. And women in these communities were independently organizing and analyzing how government policies were perpetuating racist and sexist practices. There were lots of groups like the Black Women's Collective, the Immigrant Women's Health Center, Women Working with Immigrant Women, uh, the Coalition of Visible Minority Women, and so on. And these groups were identifying and responding to unmet needs in the community. And they were addressing discrimination in immigration and employment and demanding uh, resources for services like English as a Second Language, um, training and education, and they were doing advocacy on issues of violence against women and looking at um, exploitative working conditions for women in the garment industries and in factories, in domestic work. And before the 80s, there was little to no focus on these kinds of issues as they affected women of color. So the state saw all of this movement and responded in a classic Canadian fashion. Um, funding several conferences um, on the provincial and national level throughout the 1980s, purportedly to look at some of these primary problems facing immigrant women in, in Canada. But of course, significantly, after a lot of these conferences, the necessary resources were often not forthcoming, and there was no or little implementation of the many recommendations that came out of um, these women's conferences. And I remember reading um, a piece by Linda Cardi and Beyond Brand where they said that um, the state's interest and involvement um, often takes the form of those royal commissions and advisory committees and race relations units and, of course, the big public relations payoffs in, in these conferences. All sort of strategies designed to demonstrate that uh, the state was paying attention to the issues and just fend off any sort of accusations of inaction and kind of diffuse um, conflict and placate anybody who was offended. So racialized women were, were seen as um, 
largely by the state, though, as being more interested in issues of race than gender. And white women were seen as focusing on issues of gender and not race. So abortion and childcare and pay equity were supposedly um, mainstream white women's issues. But important work was going on on the provincial level with um, the coalition of visible minority women with women like Winnie Ng and Akua Benjamin. And um, diverse women were finding common ground and learning from each other and strategizing about how to deal with the discrimination they were facing in so many different forms. And one thing that was positive about this was that groups were gaining a greater understanding of each other's different experiences um, and concrete ways of um, acting in solidarity together sort of presented themselves outside of these white mainstream feminist groups. So the, these women were organizing on employment equity, on settlement and adaptation, on uh, domestic violence, women's health, um, abortion counseling in various languages. And eventually, um, mainstream white women's organizations like NAC, uh, National Action Committee on the Status of Women, were forced to look at these issues and of racism and exclusion. This is a pamphlet from 1975 um, gathering of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. Um, that organization in the 1970s actually wouldn't have been one of the organizations that Jamaican domestic workers could have turned to when Canada was trying to deport them. NAC was really founded in um, 1971 to pressure the Canadian government to implement, to actually implement some recommendations from a royal commission. This was the Royal Commission on the, um, uh, on the Status of Women in Canada. And that was kind of the brainchild of conservative women, Tory women like Judy LaMarche and um, Laura Sabia, who were upper middle class women who had a genuine interest in examining the, um, the impact of sexism on women's lives. But uh, those recommendations uh, talked about many different things. Not, none of them talked about violence against women, surprisingly. But um, this, was, uh, this was this organization that grew out of it. And this is a list of uh, all of the different member groups. At its height, NAC had over 650 different women's organizations. And I, I thought this list was funny because it included um, the Communist Party of Canada, and the Progressive Conservative Women's Association, along with a number of women's uh, union groups, which I thought, wow, that was an interesting coalition of people. Um, and that continued like that for a number of years. What could have rallied all of these women on a common agenda back then? I looked at the, the priorities from this 1975 pamphlet, and it said equal pay for work of equal value, universal access to childcare, birth control, uh, family law reform. And then there were the other priorities, separated out. Other priorities included pension rights and support for Native women's rights. Um, so the ideological tensions, though, <laughs> they would manifest themselves and, and conflicts would arise in, in that um, later on. Um, so it's hard to quickly summarize NAC's accomplishments, um, but the online um, resource, the Rise Up Feminist Archive, is a really great resource. NAC had many wins, though, on employment, on violence against women issues, on changing laws and in politics. And some of the, their wins were working with labor, actually, very often um, to win pay equity laws, um, an affirmative action program for women in the federal public service, overhauling uh, the criminal code provisions on sexual assault, stronger protections for women um, against harassment on the job, the creation of a number of different human rights commissions and so on. Um, they were, of course, outspoken on the issues of abortion and reproductive rights. And they did work with indigenous women's um, organizations like the Native Women's Association of Canada um, on the sexist provisions in the Indian Act that led to indigenous women losing their status when they married non-indigenous men. And that led campaigns um, eventually against violence against women that established some of the early women's shelters um, across Canada. 
So um, my entree into feminism was uh, feminist activism as a teenager started with a pretty big bang because the first feminist meeting I ever went to was the National Action Committee on the Status of Women's Annual General Meeting in Ottawa. And um, truth be told, I kind of I kind of had a crush on this girl who asked me to go to this NAC <laughs> conference with her. I didn't know anything about um, lesbianism then, and sadly that weekend I didn't learn anymore. <laughs> um, but there were exciting things happening at this at this gathering. Um, I was blown away by like the several hundreds of women in these like huge rooms in a in a hotel, um, talking about politics and coaching each other. In fact on how to um, prepare for lobbying sessions that would follow the next day. Because every year, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women um, met with MPs, sitting MPs in Parliament, um, and met with cabinet ministers in the government of the day, and grilled them, grilled them in lobbying sessions. And I was like really fascinated by all of that. And uh, so this was my first feminist meeting where I was learning about all of this and we ended up making protest signs that said uh, women will be heard because um, there were a, a few politicians that actually didn't want to come to this grilling session. And we ended up getting escorted out of the public gallery by the security after disrupting parliament with our chants. <laughs> but um, we ended up in the newspapers and so, so I made my coming out as a feminist at least. Um, and it was pretty exciting and thrilling. And the evolution of that organization um, and my own evolution would lead me to return and eventually um, get elected as, a, as an executive to this body. And there were, there were problems with that though. Um, one issue was around racism, of course. And this was an issue that was being faced by a lot of mainstream organizations, including International Women's Day, which in this case in 1986 started to make inroads talking about um, the women's movement and racism. There were a few black women, like Floretta Osborne and um, John Leah Hopkins, who had long participated in that, and they were part of the executive and so on. And um, but John Leah Hopkins recalled, she said. People felt in that that they, they weren't racist. They wouldn't do racist things. But she said small little things would happen all the time. Like people would cut her off when she was speaking. And she said, we, we were called the visible minority women's committee in those days. And we were trying to organize women of color in Quebec and Nova Scotia, but the executive just wouldn't provide any money to organize outside of Toronto. She said, no one ever said no, they just ignored us. And the former um, NAC president, Judy Rebick, recalled another example. And she said, um, you know, there were resolutions that would come out at the annual general meeting. These were the priorities that would be set and that would be taken up with those politicians later on, right? And so at the annual general meeting, they used to organize the resolutions in alphabetical order by subject, right? So imagine being the visible minority women right? They were literally at the bottom of the list. She remembers that in the 1987 AGM, there were a significant number of women of color in attendance for the first time then, but their resolutions were just erased. They were dropped off the agenda because they ran out of time and didn't get to be. Um, so that's how much attention Mac was paying to the issues of women of color at the time. But that erasure would come to an end. The organization went through a new phase when um, Sunera Tabani became the first uh, woman of color president. And it was at that time that um, I was elected to the NAC executive. And Sunera's election was a moment of promise because her presidency really represented a, a, seemingly, a seeming meaningful inclusion of racialized women. Um, more of whom were also being represented on the staff and the executive throughout. Um, NAC would not only be confronting power, but women would be experimenting with transforming power itself. 
And I have to note that throughout most of, the, of its history, NAC did not do a good job at dealing with the issues of women with disabilities or um, lesbian issues. Um, but NAC did take on a, a confronting racism both inside and outside the organization. And in some new ways, power was being shared. I remember the public attacks against Sunera were vicious when she became president. Questions were raised um, not only surrounding the legitimacy of a woman of color leading a national Canadian women's organization, but around the legitimacy of Sunera Tabani being in Canada. Um, a conservative MP, um, John McDougall, actually stood up in Parliament at that time. And he claimed that she was an illegal immigrant who needed to be deported and all of NAC's funding needed to be withdrawn. And that created a firestorm. And I remember our staff getting a, a barrage of ugly and threatening phone calls and hate-filled letters, including even in one case, um, the staff received a bullet in the mail. Um, to have a national umbrella organization of avowed feminists rooted in grassroots women's groups with expertise on many different areas, weighing in on things like the budget and free trade policies and bringing national attention to violence against women issues and challenging behind closed doors dealings of a few old privileged white men ruling the country, that was really powerful. And um, in 2000, Terry Brown of the Tulpan First Nation became the first indigenous woman to serve as president of NAC. And she helped lead campaigns to investigate the deaths and disappearances of hundreds of indigenous women and girls. And so today, I actually wonder what role a NAC might have played regarding the inquiry into the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And on many other issues. Um, as women of color moved more prominently into leadership under Sumera in the 1990s, the focus of the organization became more concerned with global affairs too. We had an international issues committee, I served on that. And NAC, I remember, sent delegates to South Africa to help in the first national post-apartheid elections. And we hosted women from Latin America and uh, from Africa at some of our AGMs. And NAC expanded to deal with immigration and anti-racism and a bigger, more explicit emphasis on fighting poverty now took the center stage. This is an image of the Women's March Against Poverty. And the Women's March Against Poverty was a campaign that renewed NAC's alliance with labor. There in the front you see um, Sunera Tabati um, in orange, as well as uh, Nancy Rich in the white um, skirt of the Canadian Labour Congress. And I remember Sunera um, saying that somebody had approached her when she first became president and begged her not to wear a sari in public. Like, it was kind of ridiculous. But anyway, um, the, the Women's March was um, a moment where we refocused attention on the issue of of poverty. And NAC and the Canadian Labour Congress had never worked so closely together over such a prolonged period. This was really a national mobilizing on the issue of poverty, a word that we, I think, seldom even hear today, except used by the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Even though food bank use is rising and the homelessness crisis is intensifying. An OFL um, pamphlet uh, talking about the Women's March Against Poverty said, in 1996, the Canadian Labour Congress and the National Action Committee on the Status of Women organized a National Women's March Against Poverty with the slogan, for bread and roses, for jobs and justice. And caravans left from both the West and East Coast in May, following the CLC's convention, and the marchers traveled for a whole month, visiting about 90 nine zero different communities participating in events that involve over 50,000 women. In towns and cities, union sisters organized and mobilized events in union halls, in workplaces, in community centers, 
And these caravans ended up meeting in June in Ottawa for the largest women's demonstration in Canadian history. I think it remains the largest one to this day um, and for NAC's annual general meeting. And in amongst the crowd were the contingents uh, were from many major trade unions um, who played a prominent role. And so this was an instance of labor and community working together. We were joining forces, women of all different backgrounds and levels of education, experiences, and we were learning to stop fighting in silos. I think the march was like amazing. And I remember it was, it, it was historic. There was, but the interesting thing about it was it caught virtually no media coverage. No mainstream media wanted to talk about this. This was 1996, so we didn't have Twitter and Facebook and all the social media that we can rely on today. But it didn't get any major media coverage until it hit Toronto, where there were some of the larger demonstrations. So all of that just erased from the public platform. Meanwhile, they focused a lot on, on um, the conflict between the Reform Party and the Conservatives um, at that time. So I don't think we've seen anything like that again, not until maybe 2017 with the Women's March. So today, as, as NAFTA is reopened and there's this tinkering with the, the so-called United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, I learned that there's apparently only one mention of women in there. And it's a phrase stating in the agreement that we will, quote, seek to facilitate women's and men's equal access. That's all it says. And now I just saw that the Yellowhead Institute, which is an indigenous think tank that was just launched at Ryerson, has called on us to look more closely at that USMCA agreement and see what it might be doing to, again, um, trample on indigenous sovereignty and self-governance. So I thought about how a NAC working with labor um, I thought about how NAC worked with labor in the past to mount a coalition that was opposed to free trade and how its uh, critiques of the negative impact of these trade policies all came true. And how, as feminists, we have deepened our understanding of the disastrous consequences of the overexploitation of natural resources. And I wondered what, a role, what role a NAC employment committee or an international affairs committee might have played if it were still around today. And I also wondered who would be listening. So NAC crumbled under the weight of the massive government cutbacks. You know, they started right after that uh, MP stood up there and said uh, the funding should be withdrawn. And uh, the disappearance of so many of the uh, those over 600 different women's organizations that made up this umbrella group with the relentless cuts and it also crumbled under the weight of the tensions that surfaced between women within the organization around racism, around power sharing, and the withdrawal of many experienced white women from leadership of NAC. Those are all things that contributed to its demise. But uh, Judy Rebecca, past president and a friend of mine, says she believes that neoliberalism killed NAC. So NAC folded, but about a decade later, we got our first feminist prime minister. <laughs> in name, at least. <laughs> and in 2015, while the NDP was uh, campaigning on uh, balancing the budget, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals saw that we were tired, we were exhausted of Harper and the conservative policies. And you know, around that time, I don't know more was on the move. We saw that Hillary was running. Hashtag been raped, never reported, and the Gomeshi trial was going on, and women were talking once again in a, a massive way about resisting sexist violence. And Trudeau really moved on all of that and cast himself as the progressive choice. And you know, people were wondering, okay, what is it gonna be like when he meets Trump for the first time? Is he gonna get the handshake right? You know, what's what's the gift that he's gonna give to him when he goes to Washington and all of this kind of stuff? And what he ended up giving him was actually a picture, a framed, civil, uh, silver framed picture 
of the senior Trudeau, his father, meeting with Trump at the Waldorf Astoria. You know? And so I was wondering, yeah, what did Trudeau offer to Trump? And what I think he offered him was continuity. Continuity with better branding. This was their first meeting with all the photo ops. It was supposed to be a women's economic empowerment gathering, right? Surrounded by these women who were all just executives in major multinational corporations, largely controlled by men and largely wrecking havoc in the world, right? So as Rafia Zakaria points out, in the end, this, this liberal notion of just, you know, add women and stir, that approach, it remains dominant because it co-ops women in a way that dislocates men from optics, but not from power. So this is what we're dealing with now. So I told you a little bit about the first feminist meeting that I went to, and I want to tell you a little bit about the last time I was at a feminist um, national gathering in Ottawa. It was just in April of 2018, and it was so different. Um, it was uh, a meeting called the W7, Feminist Visions for the G7, and this was a government-sponsored and um, supported meeting. And I went because there were a number of women that I knew who were involved with the Ontario Coalition, uh, 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 Ontario um, Coalition of Agencies Serving Immigrants and um, Color of Change, Color of Poverty were involved. And so I, I went out of interest, meeting with what ended up being 60 to 70 feminists from around the world. And this was billed as, in the literature, for the first time, the G7 engagement process would include a summit of diverse feminist leaders ensuring that marginalized voices can engage equally in decision and policy making processes. Their voices, perspectives, and leadership are essential to ensuring that the outcomes of this year's G7 responds to the realities of women around the world. So this was a gathering that took place just about a month before the leaders of the G7 met at Charlevoix in Quebec. And it was amazing. I never imagined that I would end up having an opportunity to speak to the prime minister directly. He came into the, <coughs> the conference. And uh, just before then, we had been meeting. And a lawyer named Shalini Konanur was talking about how we always talk about you know, glass ceiling feminism and women shattering the glass ceiling. And she said, we, we, we often forget the women who have to sweep up the shards. Mm -hmm. And so Trudeau wasn't in the room at that time, but about half an hour or so later, he came into the room for this very scripted, um, controlled meeting with us. And um, he talked about intersectional feminism. <laughs> and he said, and of course, we can never forget the women who are sweeping up the shards from that broken glass, you know, because he had a good note taker <laughs> in the meeting with us. So he was charming, I have to say. I never, I didn't expect that I would think that, but, you know, we were still being asked to believe in a liberal feminism that those feminists in the W7 meeting were saying was obsolete. Um, so while we were meeting in this group, the Prime Minister was meeting with another group called the Gender Equity Advisory Committee. And who was on that? Melinda Gates. You know, Melinda Gates was there and she was talking about how the G7 represented security and all of these different things, wonderful things. And the women of the W7 were all saying, we were all saying, wait a minute, the G7 is the problem. So um, when Melinda was talking to us, she was talking about the work that her foundation does. And um, she let us know that she travels to all of these different countries, these poor communities. She sits in the villages with the women. She sits on the ground. You know, she gets 
she wanted to let us know that she's literally grounded, okay? She's on the floor, she's on the ground, she's grounded. She let us know that she listens. But what I don't know is if Melinda Gates wants a world in which billionaires do not exist. What I don't know is whether Melinda Gates wants a world in which there is no need for her foundation. Because people have functioning governments and public health care and education and all the things that our movements were fighting for. Because the, the people have a responsive governments, right? That were interested in redistribution of wealth through fair taxation. That's what the women in the W7 gatherings were talking about. So while Trudeau was in this other room with folks who see no contradiction between making a killing and making a difference, um, we were talking about something else entirely. And the W7 gathering was, I think, what might be described, what I was thinking of, was kind of like a feminist dream in a way. Here we were, 70 women from all over the world, many of us had never met with each other before, and in a day and a half, we came up with a whole blueprint, an agenda, and a list of demands that we thought that, a detailed agenda that we thought the governments of the world should be working on, um, what they should be doing to make this world a place where we do in fact share power equally and where everyone can live in peace, as the dish with one spoon talks about. It. And um, we were able to do that so quickly because of the indigenous rights movement, the environmental movement, all of those things that the feminist movement had gone through, black feminism, socialist thinkers, anti-globalization movements, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street, the work of all kinds of freedom movements to draw on and we had that was what had nourished us all and we brought all of that into the room with us and it was amazing because I was apprehensive but there was absolutely no discord amongst these women there was a global consensus that we had to move away and establish a new economic model um, move away from policies that fuel conflict and inequality and poverty and discrimination and climate change and land grabbing around the world. This is from the, the declaration that we came up with. That we had to move to an equitable transition away from our current economic model that's based on exploitation and extractivism to an economy that's based not on unchecked and rampant growth, but on sustainability and social economic and cultural rights for everybody on a redistribution of wealth and a provision of universal public services. That's what we were talking about. Um, and I, one of the wonderful women that I met there was a woman named Theo Soa, who was the CEO, who is the CEO of the African Women's Development Fund. And she said um, that she had come there really out of an act of solidarity. And in her experience, you know, um, lobbying and so on. She said, you never know when you might get a few wins or make some important connections. And even if one or two good decisions could come out of all of this, then it would have been worth it to her to travel from Ghana to this meeting. But she also talked about, you know, the whole women empowerment, women economic empowerment model um, that the G7 was spouting. And she said that uh, they talk about, many times, um, people in the West and in the richer countries talk about African women in terms of a set of problems, a collection of problems, you know, female genital mutilation or child brides. And she says, but what about the women human rights defenders? They never fund that. They're never into funding a change in power relationships. <laughs> It may look nice when they say women and girls, women and girls, but actually underneath nothing has changed. And going back to Zakaria again, I thought of how she said that in the international development context, women's economic empowerment may adopt feminism as a brand, 
but adopting it in substance would require a relinquishing of power by aid professionals, by elite women holding high-level political positions, by local intermediaries delivering so-called aid. So these were the, this is what a, this was a bit of my experience from the last um, gathering and I thought from all of this when somebody asked me the other day, are we going forward or are we going backward? And I said yes and yes. <laughs> Because I think we actually need to think about time sometimes in a different way. It may be a way that indigenous cultures and other cultures, non-Western cultures, embrace. That's not about a linear progression necessarily, but about generations and how we build on generations and how we look out for the next generations. And um, I thought, you know, our analysis has gotten so much better. That's what was really evident in the room at the W7. But what about the infrastructure of our resistance? It needs strengthening. So the Sankofa teaches us that, you know, we should reach back and gather the best of the past, what our past has to teach us so that we can achieve our full potential as we move forward. And I feel that many activists of today have done that. You know, I think of I Don't Know More. I think of the many women, queer and trans people who are leading some of the social movements of today, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, 15 in Fairness, um, the Women's March. You know, they know that the problems that we face are not because of this or that politician being empowered because of systemic abuses of power. They've integrated the lessons of history and they see the interconnectedness of all the struggles against oppression. I think it's these movements that are inspiring deeper conversations about what kind of society we want to live in, what our values are about solidarity They've embraced grassroots, decentralized forms of leadership. And they support and encourage spontaneous and autonomous local organizing. They create spaces for people who are new to activism, and they are organizing online and on the streets and in the community. And they're educating others, and they're combining new and old techniques. And they're using art and culture and music, and seizing opportunities to disrupt the usual narratives. And they're protesting with pleasure and being creative and courageous. They're seeking a world beyond neoliberalism, where their demands go beyond self-interest. And they've reached a global audience. They're speaking out for the public good, for education, for all, for justice, for freedom. They're acting to defend the land, the water, our ecosystem. They're acting for all of us. And I think the challenge now is for the left to continue to discover how to transform our considerable strengths into a lasting power. Your Bessie Phillips said that we're each of us standing on the shoulders of those who tilled the soil and made it ready for the next generation. She said, no, it's not the same. It can't be the same, it shouldn't be the same, the way the younger generation is going to conduct the struggle. But remembering is one of the most powerful acts of resistance there is. So what can we reclaim? Memory, language, visibility, space, community, solidarity, voice, creativity, our future. In conclusion, I'd just like to say that ours is really a story of constantly reasserting our rights and resisting erasure. Nothing short of discussing and debating and organizing and building solidarity and carving out our own agenda for freedom will get us where we need to go. And I'll leave you with some words from the Lord. The great poet, Audre Lorde, that is, <laughs> who said, Tomorrow belongs to those of us 
who conceive of it as belonging to everyone, who lend the best of ourselves to it and with joy. Thank you. So much, TK. I felt I don't know about the rest of you, but I felt like it was in, like fireworks and the grand finale at the end of the bunch of photos. Yeah. I got a bit emotional. Mm -hmm. I was having you talk for a little bit at the end. I would have come up here with a little bit choked up. But um, so we're gonna we're gonna jump into a bit of a moderated discussion as a moderated discussion as opposed to going to a, a Q and A directly with TK. And part of that is just like with the flow of, of this this evening. The, this talk about history and where we've come from and where we're going, and it's a bit next generation. We're going to bring up three students from our graduate student organizing committee, and we've um, discussed with Kike some questions that could help carry this conversation forward, but getting the, the student perspectives. So, given the the time, around seven twenty, we originally thought we might start this by around seven. So, let's maybe go for around fifteen to to twenty minutes that we still have around 20 minutes for discussion. I'm going to invite the uh, you three up and I'm going to introduce you to, to the audience a little bit more about who you are. So Aliyah, who's first up here to the table, Aliyah Kareem is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York. She's also a community organizer in the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign, which has demanded a $15 um, per hour minimum wage and stronger labor laws in Ontario. For her dissertation, she's researching the labor movements engagement with Indigenous workers and their communities in the Southern Ontario region in the hopes of building common understanding and solidarity between Indigenous and settler peoples. Her research interests include the labour community coalitions, community organizing, Indigenous settler relations, and eco-socialism. Uh, next to her, to just to Aliyah's left, is Rahina. Rahina Zarma is a doctoral student at Osgoode Hall Law School. She works on international courts in Africa, she has significant refugee law experience, having worked as a refugee officer. Uh, Rahina also has experience with community organizing, with labor unions, and the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. And Rowan Abdelbaki is a PhD student in the graduate program in sociology at York. Her research is in the areas of migration and transnationalism, citizenship, and labor. She was involved in organizing efforts for the Fight for 15 campaign at York, and is an active member of QP3903, currently serving as department steward. She's also involved in anti-racist, anti-sexual violence advocacy. So I'm going to actually hand it over fully to them. Malia is going to, going to moderate and discuss. She has, we have three questions uh, that she's going to pose, and they're going to just discuss between themselves and carry that forward, then we'll come back to the audience. I'm going to try to put this in the middle. And just let me know if you can't hear us. Um, just as Kelly said, we're going to keep this up really short and it'll mostly be, I think, reactions to your wonderful talk, PK. Um, actually, in your talk, you were uh, speaking a lot about, and just at the end there, um, looking at all these different social movements that uh, have a lot of women leading them. So, for example, the Women's March, uh, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and I Will Know More. So uh, the first question we'll start with is that women are often leading these social movements, and I think we can really see a sea change in terms of like uh, recognizing women leading these movements, right? Um, and I'm basically wondering what has been the impact uh, of women leaders in these movements again, thinking more so about like Women's March, Black Lives Matter, and I Don't Know More. So what has been their impact? Anyone want to start? I don't know that I could um, um, speak to the impact as much as I can say that there there have been significant changes and we um, we see we see that as um, not just community members but also as um, as as people who are interested in feminist issues, but also labor issues, but also um, social justice issues um, across the board, and um, and I remember when 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 Kike was talking, I was um, about sort of the history of of women in um, activism. Um, I, I I was thinking about not just the, and I thought it was interesting that that we were talking about the erasure and sort of how. Um, in the retelling of a lot of 
these stories, there is um, an obscuring of, of the role of women and sort of a, um, a recasting of it, right? Or, or a recasting of whatever um, the, the impact is. And so, but in, in real time, we do see um, the roles of women in, in whatever activist space that, that, you, that you speak to. On this panel, there are three women, and, and I, I'm not even being um, uh, facetious when I say they're, it's an all women organizing panel. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, it's, and, and it's not because we turned away any men, um, <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's, it sort of speaks to how you, you see like the, a lot of social justice issues, but also a lot of social movement and, um, and any movement really um, has, has women sort of not only leading the charge, but also cleaning up afterwards, right? Um, there is a sort of this 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 um, movement to it, which sometimes we I will I'm I'm um, honest enough to to admit that is that we resent on some level because you're like you know what if no one else is going to do it I'll just do it you know because let's be real that's sort of how our role has been historically. Um, but the other thing that I was going to say that I wanted that I wrote down was. Um, um, beyond just sort of the histories that are here. Um, in pre-colonial Nigeria, there was a, a riot that was um, organized by women against colonial, um, um, the colonial authorities. And it was the, if, uh, you can you're feel free to look it up, it was called the ABA Women Riots, it's ABA. And it was a, a movement of basically market women and local village women who were who were just dissatisfied with the roles that women were given in um, pre-colonial Nigeria, right? So if you think about it, it's like women organizing has has um, is is as old as time itself, um, and it sort of carries through to today. And um, our and sort of we we I see a role in us sort of retaking or, or reclaiming our stories or telling our own stories because it's in the telling of those stories that we like that we take ownership of of how our stories are told and sort of um, can escape the um, the the eclipsing of, of our history or our roles that sort of tends to happen in in in, um, in the telling of our stories. Uh, it's, it's an honor to follow your talk. Um, I usually talk with both my hands, so one hand is going to be going <laughs> quiet while I hold this. Um, I, I was really happy to see that you started and you talk about reclamation. Um, and I think sometimes when we reclaim stories, what we do is we reclaim suffering, but we don't reclaim our resistance. And so what happens is our identities and our resistance become tied to weak identities that were bequeathed to us by our oppressors. And so I have to say this is a very refreshing thing to hear. And so from that I'll segue into like when we're thinking about impact, I think Black Lives Matter and Me Too, when they become mainstream, when they do this amazing thing that make these struggles visible finally. I mean, we can talk about Palestinian rights openly now, actually, because we have mainstream politicians talking about them. That's amazing, right? Along with all the other things. And I think what happens, though, is that we tend to sort of insulate, and then we become co-optable. So I think that it's really important to sort of reclaim these stories of resistance. And I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I have a lot to say. These are sort of my critiques of where some of our movements have gone, whether it's Me Too or Black Lives Matter and what they highlight and what they approve. Um, I also think that, you know, I mean, we had an opening plenary this morning about intersectional labor organizing and what that might look like. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers, the main speaker, talked about the fact that labor has not even begun to acknowledge sex work as work, let alone organize these workers. Right, and so there's so much for us to do. We also have one of our biggest unions has promoted an ad for boycotting Mexican 
uh, production, right? I mean, that is something we have to think about. And, it, and so when we build, I don't want to use the word inclusive, but when we build resilient, truly emancipatory labor movements, what would that look like, right? So the role of labor as well. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Anna, again. Uh, for me, it's also an honor to um, follow talk and um, I just love uh, the movements that you were speaking about at the end and it really made me think about um, I'm doing some research with indigenous trade unionists and I have interviewed some women so far which is fantastic um, I'm really trying to um, you know recognize the uh, work within the labor movement that they've done and it's really extensive I mean they've not only uh, resisted um, you know, the uh, racism and sexism that they face in the workplaces, and that's brought a lot of indigenous women to their unions to get involved, to become leaders in their unions, um, which basically has not really been discussed, I think, I, or I don't see much literature about it. So there's a lot of work there that's uh, been done and unrecognized, so I'm hoping to, you know, um, share some of their stories. Um, but uh, you also, uh, Kike, made me think about um, basically indigenous women who have been leading for centuries and thousands of thousands of years, right, in their um, nations and, uh, you know, because uh, they had different political structures and women had more decision-making power, um, you know, that has changed, of course, under the uh, settler colonial system we're in now and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of very brutal things uh, that are still ongoing under the Indian Act, but uh, Indigenous women has, have always been leaders, have always um, defended and protected the land, and it certainly made me think um, about, you know, my relationship with uh, the land as well. So, um, you know, uh, I think a lot of indigenous women through movements and, you know, there was a photo of the women who uh, basically started the I Don't Know More movement. I think there's been a lot of important uh, reclamation being done in very recent social movements. But yeah, I do want to recognize that indigenous women have been political leaders for centuries, right? Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I know uh, we're going to run short of time, and this is a hard one. I don't know why we <laughs> agreed to do this one, but <laughs> basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, oh gosh, so angry. Um, why is progress being rolled back? Why do we have such staggering levels of income inequality, and why is there a rise in white supremacy, misogyny, and fascism, and you know, horrible things that we're seeing today? I mean, my short answer is basically <laughs> that. There's crises in capitalism. There's a crisis of profitability right now, and you know employers and those at the top will basically seize you know racism, sexism, Islamophobia, uh, fascism as a way to further divide workers and prevent us from working together in working class movements. Right. Um, so for me, it's very exciting to see. Um, you know, not just like women leading social movements, like we've already discussed, um, but even in electoral politics, which has its limits, right? But there are women, um, you know, close to here. Uh, you know, I've worked with um, Jilla Karkoch in a park down by Park, who was uh, the first Tibetan women elected, actually in North America. So it's a, it's a really big deal. And uh, I interviewed her one time, and she was talking about, um, you know, moving to Canada, and actually that, you know, first when her, her, when her family moved to Parkdale in uh, downtown Toronto, um, you know, she was doing pickup labor. She was basically like her and her family uh, going to a parking lot in Parkdale and, uh, you know, a van and someone would come along and offer like day jobs. Um, so she comes from, you know, that, that kind of beginning to go from that being like a, a low wage, like, you know, brutally exploited day labor to a sitting MPP is um, pretty amazing, right? But she comes from social movements, from community organizing, and it's really exciting to see um, you know, women in the United States. Um, I'm really inspired by Prashama Savant, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because you know they're really leading on working class issues for women. Um, and a lot of uh, these women, you know, especially like uh, Prashama, come from movements like the Fight for 15. Um, going back to our question, do you have a, a quick response about why progress is being rolled back? Um, I think some of the response to that you answered already, and it's the fact that we don't hear the word poverty anymore. We don't have a class component, at least not an obvious one. And so I think what happens is it makes us go optimal, and it makes things like identity politics go optimal by things like the yellow vests in Canada. 
or uh, the United we rolled on convoy just two days ago, right? I mean, we really have to ground our discourse in actual organizing, get very real mass organizing and real materiality. Otherwise, we make ourselves susceptible to this type of amnesia or progress or a lack thereof. Um, and we both, we all know what that's code for. So again, I'm, I'm butchering using this uh, mic right now. I'm really sorry, but I think, I think like we see it too in the academy, like the word intersectionality is, I mean, Clinton used it, so it's out for me. Trudeau was using it. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, Trudeau was using it. I actually didn't know he'd said that thing about, you know, the shards. I thought that was maybe like a Jarvis like line, but I don't know where he stole it from her. But, that's that's a real challenge and we have to really contend with that we know that when we think about migration for example like at the same time that trump announced his muslim ban and trudeau said of course refugees are welcome here in that same week he also imposed a quota on how many people we are allowed to sponsor you know so i mean it's that non-performativity of diversity speech that's really problematic and that we really have to find a way to grapple with on the left in order to not make ourselves susceptible to such easy appropriations. Um, no <laughs> yes. um, um, yeah, I'm, I agree with, 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 um, with both of you. Um, I, I do think that part of what the what the challenges are is that neoliberalism is is not only on the rise. It's sort of it it is in it is reigning supreme is really what, what how I would describe it. And as a direct consequence of that, um, inequality is it's like the, the gap between the middle class is essentially being obliterated. Like right, like it's either you're like you find yourself getting closer and closer to poverty with, with at whatever way they describe it, whether it's like one living under one dollar a day or 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 the lack thereof, um, or just slightly above it. And and those sort of conditions that we have progressively been moving towards have created um, um, conditions that where people feel like they don't have um, they don't they don't have anything sort of to turn to right beyond misogyny or hate right so and with, in whatever form it comes whether it's populism or um or misogyny or or um or you know you know incels or, or what whatever form that that, um, that hate sort of um takes the forms that it takes and so um and so the point about progress being sort of rolled back is that it's it's like um, it's like you're fighting this like I don't know giant force that has a lot of power, right? And so whatever if if like with Alia's point about like fifteen and fairness, you make this like inroad and you're like yes, we finally got this living wage, right? And then you blink and it's gone, right? And you're like. Okay, I guess we're fighting again. So it's it's this constant battle against this 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 um this monster essentially <laughs> that is like it's like this where you like cut off one head and it brings out two and then you're just like at what point do does it stop? And so the 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 question in the, this morning in the plenary where people were asking like how do you deal with this constant uphill battle where you're just like trying to like replenish some of the resources that you lose in this fight and trying not to be disillusioned, not to be like, you know what, we're all gonna die, it's okay. Um, <laughs> like, how do you keep fighting, not just, you know, inequality and and um, and racism, but also climate change and, and things that, you know, that it's just like, you can, it's like you're sitting on the train track and you can see it coming and you're really trying to like, but it's, I don't know. None of this is helpful, I realize. But anyways, um, I think to your question why this progress seems to be rolled back, I think that is a roundabout way of saying it. 
long here. We're all the last question. It's not as hard. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but this question is, um, what labor movement actions that speak to the conditions of women and people of color in Canada or elsewhere around the world um, of the past or present inspire you? And what can we learn from them? Uh, I'll get started on that, if I may. Um, because uh, being someone who has been an organizer for the Fight for 50 Fairness campaign, um, it's been extremely inspirational for me. And I know actually, TK, you know, we did uh, an action in Parkdale. So thanks so much for coming to that and supporting the campaign. Um, it has really transformed uh, my view on community organizing. Um, and, you know, I think uh, the campaign, and yeah, even though uh, we know legislative reforms uh, like Bill 148 that did uh, do a, a great overhaul of uh, labor law in Ontario, uh, it wasn't permanent, right? And we, we always knew that. So we do have to prepare ourselves for the next battle. And we're in a really bad, ugly battle with Doug Ford right now, right? But it's not completely hopeless, I think. Uh, that campaign has done so much to set like 15 as a benchmark and to you know keep putting pressure on so many issues like uh, sick days, you know time off, uh, equal pay for equal work, which has really been amplified by women. Actually, a lot of uh, women who are contract uh, college faculty workers and uh, the you know Equal Pay Coalition, who's just done like decades of work on uh, amplifying the, the the demand for equal pay for equal work. Um, but 15 and fairness, um, you know, has really been been led by a low income were um, female workers of color and actually because uh, it's a global movement and really started in the United States uh, they're still winning uh, uh, the legislative reforms for 15 and everything uh, that the demand has uh, you know demanded um, I I learned that actually this week that Illinois became the latest state to adopt the call for $15 minimum wage uh, so you know they're still going they're still winning which is incredible um, and one fast food worker living in Illinois basically said this at the bill signing this week uh, she said before the fight for 15 uh, union movement I felt voiceless all around me was overwhelming messages that I didn't matter as a fast food worker, as a single mom, that I didn't even matter as a black woman. So I heard this on Democracy Now! and I was just like, oh, like, wow, that is amazing. Like, I've, I've seen in the Fight for 15 in the United States and in Ontario, um, you know, uh, women of color who are basically fighting for dignity. Right, fighting, uh, you know, to amplify their voice and to talk about, uh, um, you know, their experiences at work and whether that be, yeah, like racism, Islamophobia, uh, you know, sexism that they face daily. Uh, they've, you know, uh, talked about that and how that is intertwined with exploitation and uh, low wage work, basically, right? Um, the movement ha in Ontario has been led by a lot of immigrant women. Right, and they've taught me like so many, you know, new and creative ways of organizing, and uh, that goes from you know different cultural things that we do in our community organizing. Um, you know, we've um, really taken on uh, a little tradition of breaking bread together, like uh, you know, eating together, dancing uh, every time that. Uh, even after Bill 47, and you know Doug Ford uh, took action to uh, delay the increase to fifteen dollars, um, even after that we celebrated and you know basically asked ourselves like, where are we now um, compared to three years ago, right? Like we really like changed the political conversation about precarious work and about uh, the need for fifteen in this province. But you know even after that we danced, and every uh, celebration that we have is like this. Um, great, you know, multicultural celebration. So, like, there's so many things to learn from, uh, from uh, you know, newcomers and uh, and people who have come uh, to the campaign and have started to organize in their communities. Um, it's really been uh, an incredible experience for me. Uh, does anyone want to go next about uh, what inspires you? I'll try and wrap up. Yes. Um, yeah, I I do think that um, there are a lot of things that. that um, that are really inspiring about organizing, but also about women who's organizing. Um, um, just as an anecdote, like I, I met Rowan as a consequence of um, of being uh, at the picket lines with QP, right? Um, um, who knew that something would come out of that? <laughs> um, um, yeah, so there is there is community building in um, in organizing. There is something about knowing that you're not alone in in this, and that there are people not just um, not just in your immediate community, but also 
abroad who are fighting for similar things and are also doing similar things and are getting even if it's and and I realize that it's it's in, it's incremental. It's it's like. Uh, um, it's like looking at a paper you wrote two years ago and be like, what? <laughs> How did I get into grad school? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then looking at you like, you know what, I think I'm growing. I don't know how I'm doing it, but it's happening. Um, so I feel like on, on some level, it's, 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 it's so part of that process where it's like incidental and incremental. And, and you see these, these labor movements and, and um, organizing and like marches and you're like, you know what? There is good in the world, and there is something to hope for. And we're not, you know, you know, we're gonna go out in a blaze of glory or some, you know, something more dramatic than that. But yeah, there is something to be said about like seeing these these sorts of movements and also conversations that you think are that are that you thought were on the fringes at, before. That somehow people were talking about how millennials are socialists, and you're like, what? Really, it's not just um, Coley side New York. Um, so it's 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 nice. You you kind of see it, and you're like, Ocasio well, Cortez is talking about billionaires, and you're like, what? This is Twitter is changing the landscape, and this I did not know. But anyway, so there there is some movement um, to end. I think this is a great question to end on because the other one was a little depressing. Um, but there is some some um, some movement, and it's it's kind of inspiring if if you if you believe in in sort of the work that you're doing. Well, you referenced TV, so I guess I'll just remind everybody we've heard of TV and we were infamous for long strikes. Um, and one of the reasons we were striked were basically three seasons winter, spring, and summer. Uh, and one of our key red line issues was um, to win a fund for uh, survivors, sexual assault survivors. Um, and that was one of our red lines. Um, I know, though, and our union is not perfect, that many people did not want to strike for this issue. So as we're moving forward, how do we actually make women's issues working class issues, like on unions' agendas? And so when we're thinking about hope, I'm thinking about the green tide in Argentina, uh, and just reading about it, I'm no expert, but it's just been really exciting to see how despite the defeats and legal assaults on abortion rights, women who represent half of the working class have been able to put force, put pressure on their union leaders and say, actually, we're going to strike anyway, because this one woman has been assaulted or harassed by the manager. It's just wildcat. It's, you, it's, women are just going on strike. Right? And so we have to be able to build these capacities because to actually give meaning to this fancy slogan that women's rights are workers' rights, right? Like they can be. And I think there's so much to be learned from that movement. And you know, I, I don't know if that's happening here um, or in such in, in a very visible way, but I think that's sort of where I'd like to see us go in the next little while. Thank you. So we have spoken a lot, and uh, basically we want to open the floor for questions and comments, um, more so for Kike and uh, your fantastic talk. We've, we've spoken enough, so um, does anyone have questions for Kike? Maybe we can invite Kike back out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. We can invite Kike back up, and if you also want to stay there, you guys, just in case someone has hey, questions for you, and uh, yeah. just have to pass around the microphone. So I'll let you facilitate the yeah, Any questions or comments? All right, perfect. Okay, going once. <laughs> Maybe I know uh, we're we are approaching eighty. We're getting a little tired, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or do you have any questions for me? Okay. You want to uh, respond to any of our um, questions that you have for our panel? Well, I was just curious to hear more, a little bit more about. Um, you started broaching onto the topic of what you thought the impact of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. was and stuff like that. But then um, I'm wondering within a number of these movements, I think 15 and Fairness is a good example. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people from all different backgrounds who are coming together and doing this work. I talked in my talk about 
this cleavage that existed you know, between the mainstream white feminist organizations and you know, just people kind of operating in silos. And as I grew up a lot of the time, you know, that's what was happening. We were like working with some people on police brutality over here, or we were working on this over here. And we've all recognized, I think, that we need to integrate all of these struggles that are interconnected. I'm wondering if you're seeing like a much more improved understanding of that, or you're still seeing the fault lines, because you just gave an example of one of the fault lines, right, within labor not acknowledging. Yeah. Still fault lines, but I still there much in in some of the organizing around uh, sexual violence. Uh, there's still a lot of white liberal feminism, right, and still like appropriation of um, women of color stories, mm -hmm. and we don't know what to do with that. And so when you were when you were talking about the first meeting, the first feminist meeting, of the last feminist meeting, my last feminist meeting was with a, you know women of color trying to organize and unfortunately against other women to actually recognize what it might mean to actually take an intersectional approach to some of these issues. And so these fault lines still exist. And so yeah, my comments were coming from that place. Also thinking about some of the debates around pessimism or futurism. And I don't know what that means. And I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, have firsthand experience of this, but been in, I get, I'm around academics, so I hear this stuff all the time. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm hedging because I don't know. It, it goes to that sort of are we making progress or are we going backwards forward? All of that kind of thing again. Um, I was actually wondering, and I could definitely open up uh, to the audience. Um, but, uh, and I'm assuming that like most people are in and around the Toronto area. I know that we do have some uh, people from out of town for this conference, but you know, basically in Ontario with this conservative majority government, uh, they're just basically throwing like fires and crises everywhere, right? It just like seems every other day there's something else uh, going on, something that they're cutting. Uh, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, drastic changes to post-secondary education uh, in terms of like, okay, yes, it was great that the uh, conservatives are proposing a cut to tuition, but they're not actually making up for that loss right. in revenue for universities, right? Um, like they're doing all kinds of things, and yeah, of course, like delay the increase to fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage. Um, so, what is a way of um, you know uniting some of our struggles? Because I do see even unions like going after like all these different things, and we have like a hundred petitions about all these different <laughs> issues. So every day we're just kind of like running around in all these fires, right? So what can we do to unite us? If you have any thoughts, yeah, we can get a binder for anybody. But I think that that's perfect for well, right? Yeah. The intent is to keep us running like chickens with our heads on so we don't actually stop to think about how to really address the root. And to actually do something about it. That's just my way of thinking, right? So we're we're busy surviving, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then because yeah, you're you've got to pay the bills, you gotta live. Mm -hmm. So that's becomes your primary focus, and then everything else kind of right? Mm -hmm. Was there another hand? No. No, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I would like to see, I know like the labor movement here has some plans to uh, basically try to get uh, different unions together. Uh, I think they call it the power of many, like that's uh, potentially a future campaign that they're gonna do uh, to try to unite, um, you know, the pushback against uh, Doug Ford. So I think, you know, that's pretty exciting. There's a lot to learn uh, from, you know, past battles against uh, Mike Harris, right, uh, in the 1990s. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot to look forward to. I'm not totally like hopeless, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, I'm not feeling great about Doug Ford, but um, 
you know, some of the women who have led, like the Fight for Truthful Experience, Black Lives Matter, um, Indigenous struggles, uh, you know, I, I do see that they're, they're going to lead the pushback. They already are, you know, against it. Yeah, did anyone else want to comment or ask a new question? Did you want to respond to anything else that we've discussed? <laughs> yeah, no worries. Or Kike, did you want to uh, leave any closing remarks? From the uh, Lord. I, from the Lord. <laughs> from, oh, from the Lord. <laughs> uh, I like to. I like to run for a bit I find very inspiring. But um, just to say that you know, I think one of the things that we can do. You are doing right now. Um, it's really important to have these discussions. You know, I, I think about you know Davos and the G7 and all of this. Thing. These people are gathering. They are talking to each other. They are meeting. They are strategizing. They are thinking about the plans. They are thinking about it from a world domination perspective, literally. And we need to use everything that we do already have to make our own vision, which is so much more loving um, and necessary at this time, um, make it real. I think a lot of the, you know, sometimes I think about what people did in the past. Whenever I get sort of down, I think about not just the people who are out there struggling today, which gives me a lot of hope, but also the people who had so much less than us, and just did it, you know? Women who started shelters in their houses, you know, women who just said, okay, we don't have any government funding, I'm just gonna start a crisis line though, and I'm gonna do it. And yes, those things, you know, later on became co-opted to some extent, professionalized to some extent, but they also became more widely extended and available for many people. So I think sometimes it's just, you know, just starting and doing and being out there. And the thing is that to remember that, you know, okay, maybe we didn't succeed this time. Maybe Bill 148 was rolled back. But that doesn't mean that it's a total loss because how many new connections were made there? And like we saw with Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955 turned out to be the turning point day, right? But so many women and people before that did that same action and it did lead to something. It led up to that day. Mm -hmm. So this is why I think we always have to think about layers of work, layers and generations of work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs>